Guilty of second degree murder, a lesser included offense without a weapon. Two children left alone to play, and a six year old girl ends up dead. I know I don't show my emotions much, and I myself am not sure why. But that doesn't mean I don't. When a life sentence is one of the most severe punishments a court of law can give, reserved for only the sickest of criminals. But what happens when those criminals are children? Today we look at 20 juveniles who were tried as adults and the shocking things they did in court as we explore the 20 most dangerous killer kids reacting to life in prison. We start with Roxana Sikorsky, who was just 15 years old when she plotted to take out her own parents with the help of her boyfriend. I would like to apologize. October 17, 2004, at approximately 2 a.m., Sikorsky is sneaking through her house in Plymouth Township, Detroit, following instructions being texted to her by her 23-year-old boyfriend, Michael Rivera. He is outside her house, and the pair are about to carry out a sickening plot to wipe out her family, before the young romantics disappear together in the hope of living happily ever after. Why would she do this to her own family? because they were trying to stop her and Riviera from seeing each other. She would take out each member one by one. After she tried to take the life of her own little brother, who was found with injuries to his neck, she panicked and fled with Rivera. Her brother was lucky to be alive, and when the killer couple was apprehended, the details that came out in court shocked everyone. I promise that I will get better, no matter what happens. Both were found guilty. August of last year, Rivera got life in prison, and now it's Roxana's turn to learn her fate. Sikorsky was sentenced to 10 to 20 years, and during the trial and sentencing, she showed the whole world just how unhinged she was. To my family, <laughs> for not being the daughter they wished I would be. Which brings us to one of the youngest Americans to ever receive a life sentence. It's shocking to think that Lionel Tate was only 14 years old when he was sent to prison for life without the possibility of parole. That is until you discover what he did to one innocent six-year-old. When Tiffany Eunuch's mother left her daughter with one of her friends, Kathleen Grosset Tate, she would have been safe in the knowledge she would be cared for. But when Tiffany was left alone with the 13-year-old Lionel Tate, the scene soon turned into a nightmare. He was play fighting with her and didn't understand that it could lead to her death. Tate rushed downstairs to say Tiffany had stopped breathing. But what had happened in the few minutes the children were out of her sight? Her injuries were catastrophic. The prosecution even going as far as to say they were, similar to those she would have sustained by falling from a three-story building. It was determined Tate did not intend to take Tiffany's life that day and somehow lost his cool during a play fight. Even so, Florida state law requires he was tried for first-degree murder. To defend his client, Lewis devised a controversial explanation for the boy's actions, that Lionel had accidentally killed Tiffany while imitating the staged violence of professional wrestling. There was a lot of opposition to him being treated as an adult, but the trial would go on, and he would be found guilty of taking Tiffany's life. If Tate had any remorse for what he did, then he didn't show it at the sentencing, where he remained emotionless throughout. Next, one young man who had plenty of emotion to show and a disturbing lack of remorse. The Chardon High School incident took place on February 27, 2012. It is one of the most tragic incidences to occur within a school, which left several survivors with lifelong injuries. The main perpetrator and mastermind was 17-year-old TJ Lane. The brother in the courtroom and that did this was not the brother I knew. It began around 7.30 a.m. in the cafeteria while the students were eating breakfast. Lane entered and the scene turned into one of horror as he took his firearm and emptied it into the crowd. In the carnage, six students ended up in the hospital. Tragically, three of those did not survive their ordeal and passed away within days 
A fourth was permanently affected and would never walk again. I hate you for the pain you've caused. This whole thing was caught on security cameras and Lane was swiftly apprehended and his name was released by the press on August 28, 2012. If you think Lane was ready to show any remorse for his actions, then think again. Throughout the trial, he would remain defiant and even disrespectful, smiling his way through the hearing. He can only act smug as he listens to the pain he has caused. You will never ever be in my thoughts after this. Never. My family will move on, not you. On March 19th, 2013, Lane received three life sentences with no chance of parole. The quiet city of Sheboygan Falls in Sheboygan County, Wisconsin is a peaceful place with very low crime and a sense of community. But the city was rocked on September 17, 2012, when popular and loving 78-year-old great-grandmother Barbara Olson was discovered lifeless. And at first, she looked like she had suffered an accident in her garage where she was found. It turns out, she lost her life in a very unnatural way. But even more shocking was who was responsible for taking her life, her own great-grandson. Antonio Barbaro would prove that if you're not safe with your own grandson, then who are you safe with? He and his friend Nathan Pape had contacted the plan to rob the elderly woman of all her cash. On that fateful night in September, Barbaro turned to Pap and produced a hatchet. He told Pap of his plan and convinced him to go along. What was that plan that you discussed with Nathan? We were gonna try to scare her to get money and then use force if needed. Was there a discussion about what type of force you might use? An attack, uh, I guess to kill. When they were inside the Olsen's house, Barbara lunged for his grandmother, inflicting over 25 devastating injuries. 12 hours after the tragedy, the pair were arrested after the clothing used during the incident were found in Barbara's school locker. They were tried as adults in the explosive trial that started in June 2013. Pap's legal team argued that he was a pawn used by Barbaro. Friend turned on friend today in the trial of a teenage boy in the murder of a 78-year-old woman. Evidence showed both suspects were to blame and they were sentenced to life. Barbaro showed some signs of remorse when he tried to read out a statement and the gravity of his situation became too much. I know I don't show my emotions much. I myself am not sure why, but that doesn't mean I don't. In this next case, there is no redemption, as one young man from the United Kingdom follows in the footsteps of his hero, the Night Stalker. Stuart Harling's obsession with taking someone's life began when he watched a documentary about Richard Ramirez. He fell in love with the idea of becoming as notorious as the infamous Night Stalker of 1980s America. Inspired by what he saw, he began fantasizing about committing the same depraved acts. Around the same time, Harling became immersed in the world of video games and some questionable websites, and soon shut himself off from his family altogether. By 19, he became so addicted to his lifestyle that he left his career in accounting and spent all his time online. Then Harling concocted a plan of pure evil. After planning a route to Hornchurch County Park, he would bide his time and wait for the perfect moment to strike. April 6, 2006, and Harling would find his victim. 32-year-old Cheryl Moss was taking a break from the hospital she worked at, which was right next to the park. She had been working at the hospital for over a decade and had recently become engaged. As Moss took a stroll, Harling appeared from the bushes in a wig and sunglasses and struck without warning. The savage nature of the onslaught was shocking, and many of the wounds inflicted happened while Miss Moss was on the ground and likely unable to defend herself. Cheryl Moss lost the fight to live, and Harling was arrested. It's what he told psychiatrists later that is the most terrifying part of all. He explained that he felt nothing for his victim. He was found guilty of taking Moss's life and was sentenced to serve 20 years in prison, meaning this cold-blooded barbarian would be free to walk the streets again by the time he's 40 years old. Stuart Harling very carefully planned how to take a person's life, unlike the dangerous driver in this next case. 
This is the scene that unfolded on September 21st, 2015, as horrified doctors and nurses ran for cover. This is 17-year-old Jessica Carnline, who was behind the wheel when the crash took place. What she didn't realize at the time is just how serious this situation was about to become. Carnline was driving towards the Wyoming Medical Center with two passengers, Brandon Avery and Amanda Strickland, both 27. Somehow she lost control, hitting a sign just in front of the hospital before colliding with the building itself. Investigators later found out the car was traveling at 76 miles per hour at the time, leading police to believe something was either wrong with the car or the driver. In the chaos, her two passengers were critically injured and became victims of vehicular homicide. Carnline was also injured but survived and would likely live to face the consequences of her own reckless actions. She remained emotional throughout the trial and was often seen with tears running down her cheeks, which is no surprise considering what was revealed during the case. I understand and sympathize with your pain, but I too have suffered an immense loss. It turns out she had unintentionally cost two of her friends their lives. And even though she appears remorseful, she was found guilty and sentenced to 12 to 16 years incarceration. Caleb Sharp needs little introduction. You might remember him as the young man responsible for the Freeman School incident in Spokane, Washington in 2017. He was handing out notes to his friends and it said that he was gonna do something stupid. The chilling case made headlines around the world with disturbing images and videos showing 15-year-old Sharp hunting for his victims in the hallways of his school, as if playing a game of cat and mouse. One heroic young student, Sam Strahan, attempted to stop Sharp in his tracks. Despite his best efforts, he couldn't stop Strahan, who pulled the trigger and took his life right in the middle of the school corridor. Other students and staff rushed to stop the chaos, and in the commotion, three other students went down. It was a miracle that others weren't hurt, and several teachers managed to apprehend Sharp and potentially save a lot of lives. It took a long time for this case to get to trial, with Sharp remaining behind bars for five long years before finding out his final fate. But when the trial did start in 2022, there were over 200 impact statements from those who were there or have suffered as a direct result of that fateful day. Although he was emotionless as he was sentenced, he did have something to say to the court. Now that I'm here, I can see clear as anything that it's really the only one thing I can say. That's how I'm sorry. I'm sorry to this entire community. I'm sorry to every single person I forced PTSD upon. Kaylin Sharp is looking at 30 years behind bars for those few minutes of mindless stupidity. July 22, 2015, police receive a call from a terrified 12-year-old boy. Daniel Bever was from Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, and he told the dispatcher his family was under siege at their home. The dispatcher reported someone else said hello, and the line went dead. By 11.30 a.m., first responders were on the scene and walked straight into a nightmare. Five of the eight members of the family had lost their lives due to injuries sustained by Sharp Implement. David and his wife, April, and children, Daniel, Christopher, and Victoria, were found downstairs when the caller, Daniel, was found on the first floor of the house. Police did find survivors. The youngest child, who was only two, was found safe and well, and 13-year-old Crystal, who had watched her family get wiped out as she lay wounded. As if this case wasn't shocking enough, she then names her two brothers as the perpetrators. They were the only two family members not in the house at that time. 18-year-old Robert and his 16-year-old brother Michael were quickly apprehended in woodlands behind the house. What they revealed at the trial sent shockwaves through the media. They both had fantasized about becoming famous by taking the lives of their own flesh and blood. They got their notoriety and sat emotionless as their life sentences were read out. But these aren't the only two brothers capable of pure evil as this next case shows. It's heartbreaking to think that 12 and 13 year old children are capable of what Derek and Alex King did to their father, Terry King. 
Many argue that they were ending years of tormenting by their father, but their story doesn't quite add up. November 26, 2001, first responders arrive at the home of Terry King in Cantonment, Florida, to find it completely ablaze. When they eventually got the fire under control, they were horrified to find the body of King. But he had not fallen victim to the blaze. He had suffered a much more tragic end. He said that he made sure that his father was asleep. His own two children, Derek and Alex, had taken an aluminum baseball bat and lunged at their father with it. The injuries he sustained were too much, and he passed away at the scene. They set fire to the house in hopes of concealing their crimes and fled to the trailer of a family friend, Ricky Chavez. He hid the boys and even washed the incriminating evidence from their clothing, a move that would see him face some serious charges. The trial exploded across the media, with many believing the boys were innocent and were putting an end to the years of torment at the hands of their father. But one major problem was the brothers' story. They started by saying they were responsible for taking King's life and then changed their story to claim they were persuaded by Chavez to do it. Finally, they accused Chavez of taking King's life and even tried to play the victims by saying they were convinced into taking the fall. Chavez was cleared of all the most serious charges, but was found guilty to being an accessory to the crime. In 2002, the trial came to an end. Derek received eight years and Terry was given seven. Both boys have long since been released and still walk the streets to this very day. For a 14-year-old boy, Philip Chisholm had some dark, disturbing desires. Those desires would be unleashed on his own school teacher in October 2013. 24-year-old Colleen Ritzer was beloved at Danvers High School in Massachusetts. She would go out of her way to help anyone. Chisholm, born in 1999, had only recently moved to the area. Apart from being on the school soccer team, he did almost no socializing. She was helping Chisholm with an upcoming test, so she asked him to stay behind after school. At some point during the conversation, it is reported that Chisholm lost his cool with Ritzer and began talking to himself. After most of her students had gone, he followed Ritzer into the toilets and committed the most unthinkable acts on his own teacher. She did not survive what must have been a terrifying ordeal and a tragic end to a promising young life. But Chisholm wasn't finished there. He concealed her body and hid her in the woods behind the school. And what he did next is enough to send chills up your spine as he went and bought a cinema ticket with his victim's credit card. Back at the school, it had become aware that both Chisholm and Ritzer had disappeared after he failed to show for a soccer practice. At first we thought he was either abducted or just gone missing. But he was in fact hiding. Chisholm was actually caught by luck as he was stopped by police on a routine safety check while walking home in the early hours of the morning. They found Ritzer's credit card and other incriminating evidence on him. But it was when officers saw his hands that they knew they had their man. He had not washed himself since the incident happened and still had his victim's DNA on his hands. Even worse, he admitted it was Ritzer's and told the police she was buried in the woods. He was tried as an adult and would be found guilty as charged with a sentence of life. Ritzer's mother wept in court as the verdict was read out. Chisholm didn't even react. For the period of not less than 40 years. And not Philip Chisholm will serve 40 years in prison before he gets a chance for parole. His mother broke down in tears. He will have a chance to parole. But let's hope this maniac stays behind bars where he deserves to be. Back to the United Kingdom, where we explore another teen obsessed in fame and will do anything to get it. Colchester is a small town in England known for its sense of community and family values. On the 24th of March, 2014, that peace would be shattered forever. A local man was walking through the park at around 5.45 a.m. when he came across the gruesome sight of a lifeless adult male. Father of five, James Atfield, had lost his life due to injuries from a sharp instrument. All in all, he had over 100 wounds all over his body, many inflicted as his victim lay helpless. Three months later, on June 17th, another victim was found. 
31-year-old Nahid Almania had only been in the United Kingdom for six months while studying at the International Academy. The day after her body was discovered, police announced they were looking for possible links between the two incidents. It would take until May 2015 before he was apprehended. A woman was walking the Salary Brook Trail when she noticed a man hiding in the bushes and she decided to call the police. James Fairweather was the 15-year-old hiding in the bushes and police arrested and charged him with taking the life of the two recently found victims. It was his cold, emotionless retelling of what he had done and how he had planned both incidents that shows how little remorse he has for the pain and suffering he caused. Some the voices were talking to me, you need to make a sacrifice or we're gonna come and get you, you need to do it. He appealed his case on the grounds of mental health but was ultimately rejected. Nehemiah Greggio was only 15 when he planned to eliminate his own family. Even worse, they were only the first in a long line of victims he wanted to claim. On January 19th, 2013, Greggio armed himself, took aim and pulled the trigger on his mother, father, and three of his siblings in their family home in Albuquerque, New Mexico. They were all asleep in their beds and could not have known what was coming before it was too late. But he wasn't satisfied there and right after he headed to his local Walmart to continue his campaign of terror. Had he not been apprehended on the way, there could have been many more victims. Greggio confessed to his crimes and was ultimately tried as a juvenile, which meant his sentence would be lighter. The prosecution successfully appealed and Greggio would eventually receive three life sentences and would serve at least 30 years in prison. He did apologize to his family and seemed remorseful, and it's no surprise considering the seriousness of the situation he was in. I am sorry for taking our parents and our sins. You know, I wish I could take it back, but reality is that we can't. This was an extremely sickening crime, but this next psychopath is on a whole new level of depravity. When Ashley Smith left her boyfriend, Dylan Shoemaker, to babysit her two children on March 19th, 2013, she should have been safe in the knowledge that they were safe and well. When she returned to her home in Springville, New York, she found the worst case scenario waiting for her. Her eldest son, two-year-old Austin, had been badly hurt. Shoemaker was just 16 at the time, and when Austin wouldn't stop crying, he decided to silence him, but he went a step too far. Sadly, the little boy did not pull through. And when this case hit the courtroom, Shoemaker tried to play innocent. He tried to persuade the judge that he didn't know what the consequences of his actions would be and that he never intended to take Austin's life. I didn't mean to kill Austin. I didn't mean to hurt him. But after he was caught sending text messages to his mother, where he claimed he could use his age and appearance to win sympathy from the jury, his defense began to crumble. Then, 13 witnesses came forward to testify that he was in fact a manipulator and a deceiver. And after that, his claims of innocence fell on deaf ears. Shoemaker was in floods of tears, but it was deemed to be a show to win sympathy and he was sentenced to 25 to life. If Shoemaker could be accused of putting on a show, then the next juvenile can be accused of putting on a whole parade. This is 19-year-old Damon Kemp. On the surface, he appears to be suffering in pain and being forced into the courtroom against his will. You can almost feel sorry for him. That is until you learn what he did on December 6th, 2018 at the Jade Park apartment complex in Daytona Beach, Florida. The evening before police officers were investigating a disturbance at the apartment complex when out of nowhere Kemp approached them and confessed to taking a life. He ran away from the scene, but when police discovered where he lived, they went to check his address. Inside were the lifeless bodies of Trey Ingram and Jordan Patton, both 19 years old. Nearby, they found a firearm and it contained the Prince of Damon Kemp. This case would take a dramatic turn when it was time for the suspect to face the courtroom, where he put on a performance that would not win any acting awards. If this was an attempt to gain sympathy, then the judge was not falling for it. 
The suspect soon turned quiet when he was refused bail and suddenly seemed lost for words as he was wheeled out of the courtroom. It would take five years for Kemp to finally receive his guilty verdict, which would be three life sentences. If you thought crimes like this were a modern phenomenon, then this next case will show history had always had its fair share of dangerous juveniles. Newcastle, England, 1968. The country is about to discover their youngest killer. What Mary Bell did to two 10-year-old children was utterly shocking. The inner suburb of Scottswood would be rocked by the revelation that someone so young could commit such a heinous act. The warning signs had been there since May 11th, the same year, when a boy was thrown off a seven-foot-high roof, injuring his head as he landed. Police questioned Bell and her friend Norma Bell, who was no relation, but due to their age, the case was dismissed and they were both being given a warning. At the time, the Victorian style and heavily outdated houses were being demolished around the city. And it was in one of these derelict houses that Mary Bell explored some dangerous games. At around 3.30 p.m. at 85 St. Margaret's Road, the lifeless body of 11-year-old Martin Brown was found with injuries to his neck. It appeared as if someone had taken his life in the most chilling way. Several weeks later, Mary and Norma broke in and vandalized a nursery. That had left several incriminating notes at the scene, admitting they were responsible for the incident at St. Margaret's Road. But police at the time did not know the identity of the person who had written the note. But it would all become clear after July 31st, 1968, when Mary and Norma took the life of another boy. Unable to live with the guilt, Norma told her parents, who then called the police. As this was 1968, when this kind of thing was rare, the media went into overdrive. Eventually, the courts discovered Mary Bell was solely responsible for the loss of both victims and was found guilty as charged. Her friend Norma was acquitted. Mary and her family broke down during the sentencing. In a shocking twist, Bell was released back into the free world in 1980 at age 23 meaning she had the opportunity to live her life, something she had denied her victims. When Austin Myers and Timothy Mosley planned to rob a safe from the home of 18-year-old Justin Back, they had no idea the world of trouble that was coming their way. The two 18-year-old students went to the same school as their victim in Waynesville, Warren County, Ohio, and when Myers asked Mosley if he wanted to make some money, he was all for it. The idea was simple. Drive to Back's house while he was out and help themselves to the $20,000 they believed was in the safe. Unfortunately for Back, he was home when they arrived. Suspecting no danger, he invited them in. When he did, all hell broke loose. The two assailants lunged for back when he wasn't looking. And after a struggle, they overpowered him and ended up taking his life on the kitchen floor. Tim said a big idea if we made it look like a runaway or something. If we had ended up wrapping him up in a blanket and put him in the trunk. The pair were arrested, and when it came time to face the court, they would face severe punishment. Mosley was given life, but Myers came off much worse, sentenced to pay the ultimate price. Although his words appeared to show remorse in the courtroom, the statement he delivered was empty of all emotion and feeling. No, I've made a horrible mistake. Uh, I'm only 19 years old. I, I think there's a, a lot of good things I can do with my life if you allow me to keep my life. Next, an urban legend becomes a part of real life. When two 12-year-old friends, Anissa Weyer and Morgan Geyser, lured their friend Peyton Lutner into the woods of Waukesha, Wisconsin on May 31st, 2014, it was to play hide and seek, or at least so Peyton thought. I shouldn't be alive. I really shouldn't after what happened. The Slender Man became a part of popular culture in 2009, and when Weyer and Geyser became hooked on the urban legend, trouble would only follow. The girls wanted to take a life and then meet their sinister hero. So while playing in the woods, Wire and Geyser pinned down Lutner and then caused injuries that would leave this terrified young girl clinging on for life. Despite being severely injured, Lutner managed to crawl to the nearest road, 
where a cyclist stumbled across her and called for help. Wire and geezer were found on the interstate nearby, and in their bag was a sharp implement that they had used on their victim. They told the police they were trying to find the slender man's mansion and had hoped to appease him by taking the life of their friend. It was clear that neither of the girls were of sound mind and an emotional trial began. They were both tried as adults, but after intense negotiation, Wire managed to escape prison, but was sentenced to 25 years in a mental health institution, but was released under supervision. Geyser would face a longer sentence and was found not guilty by reason of insanity and would be sentenced to 40 years to life in a mental health institution. She managed to win release after seven years, but would remain supervised until she is 37 years old. As a gift for his graduation, 18-year-old Cameron Heron was given a black Ford Mustang, and he decided to take it for a race. He took his own friend, 18-year-old John Barineau, along, and they challenged each other down a race, Bayshore Boulevard in Tampa Bay, Florida. Jessica Reisler was visiting Tampa from Ohio and had taken her 20-month-old daughter, Lilia, out in her stroller. What should have been a relaxing morning walk turned into chaos as she was soon staring down two speeding vehicles heading straight towards her. In the collision, both mother and baby tragically lost their lives, needlessly wasted at the hands of Heron and his reckless behavior. Her widow spoke emotionally at the trial. I've suffered horrifically every moment. Heron's trial attracted a lot of media attention, and he appeared remorseful throughout, and was even expecting a light sentence after his lawyer suggested it. Things didn't go his way. He would receive 24 years for the loss of the mother and 14 for her baby. And the look in his eyes is enough to tell us exactly what was going through his head, from terror on the highway to terrorizing an entire county. During the summer of 2013, the residents of Oscola County, Florida were living in fear. June 25th and the shooting of 17-year-old David Guero along Central Avenue in Kissimmee sent shockwaves across the county. Over the next week, several homes were fired at by an unknown assailant. Some bullets even penetrated the houses, but thankfully no one else had been harmed. People were afraid to even stay in their homes, and the situation escalated on July 3rd with the death of Eric Rupnarin on the Ponciana home. Conrad Schaefer had been the mastermind behind this campaign of terror and would face the full weight of the law. When Schaefer faced a courtroom, he spent most of the time with his head down. And even when he did apologize, the judge wasn't buying it, as he sentenced him to life, saying prison was the only way to keep the world safe from this dangerous individual. He will have to serve at least 25 years before even thinking about freedom. And finally, to one teenager who realized what they had done was wrong and caused unbelievable scenes in the courtroom. Samantha Grigg was 18 when she drove Brendan Hyam, 16, and Tyrell Brendeditz, 18, to East Lansing, Michigan on February 15th, 2014. This was no pleasure cruise. They two boys with her were going to rob someone. So was Greg simply an innocent party coerced into giving the two a lift? No, she knew exactly what was going down, but she did not expect the situation to turn so serious. Dustin Frolka, 19, was a fellow student of Haim and Bernatitz, but he had no idea they had been planning to try and rob him. They ended up taking Folka's life and in court, Greg would face the consequences of what she had done. Folka's stepmother told Greg exactly what she thought of her. That led to this emotional outburst. Greg will face life in prison, where it will be a very long time before she can give anyone a ride again. Let me know what you think about the case in the comments. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and turn on those notifications so you can keep up with every chilling case.